Okay, I am back and we got the recording started. Um, again, the, um, this is Andrea and we will be going through the ITC payroll for redesign training. Um, just a little beginners, just overview of our options here in the payroll side. Um, again, I have everybody muted. So if um, anybody has questions, um, you can unmute yourself and um, please ask the question or you can um, do a group chat also. And I will try to watch that so I can make sure I see you. And if I don't, I will definitely get to you. Okay, today, and actually if you have the um, PowerPoint um, up on your screen or if you have it printed, um, I'm kind of going to go through, stay on that. Um, as of today, what we're doing is core, the menu options under the core, and also we're going to be going through the employee dashboard. So we got about three hours to go through this today, so hopefully we can get through everything today. Um, and hopefully, I, and if I'm going too quickly, please let me know. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to um, do is everybody's going to see different options on your screen. Not everybody, you know, the districts are going to have the same um, roles. So people um, in districts can go to system and roles, and this is where they can actually give the people what they want to see. They have and it's lot, I mean, I know some of you probably are not familiar with classic, so I might be referring to classic terms because a lot of it that way you can say, okay, this is what classic was, this is what redesign was. So like in classic, this is what in redesign, um, you can give them certain roles and, and you can do that just by going to create, which Lori will be going over more on this on the next couple of days. Um, but I just wanted to show you, this is where they can pick these different roles and they can only see certain options underneath the core or certain things. So it's not, um, it's really handy that they only have certain um, permissions that they can be given and they can't see anything else. Um, and this is a whole nother day um, of working with roles and permissions. But I just kind of wanted to go through that, that not every does every person in a district will have the same options up here or be able to see only a few of these under core and that's because of the role and permissions so i just kind of wanted to go over that first okay so we're going to move on to the core so what the core is the core is what is your central pieces of your payroll so um, this is where you are adding an employee you can modify employees, employer data here. So this is be like going back to the class of the USP con screen, USP dat. So more um, is a little bit of both. So that's what's going to be under here. So our first piece is going to be um, a kind of what I want to go through is before we get started is the mass change. Um, the mass change. This is going to show under certain options underneath your core. And I know some, um, we compare this to uh, the classic data tree. So we always say, be very careful when you're using this mass change. If you give it to districts or you let the ITCs, you guys just do it yourself, just like a data tree would have been. Um, again, in order for this mass change to actually show on these certain um, menu core options, um, you have to go to the systems and modules. And you have to make sure that this mass change service is added. So right now it's installed because I have the little minus. If it has the plus here, that means it's not installed. So that would be how that mass change actually gets on these different um, core options. <clears throat> so that it would be their first step in order to get that mass change to show. Okay. And then and then also the user, um, maybe your permissions to, in order for the mastering service module, um, you have to have group manager role and then also have the admin mass change permission. So that's another two things that you would have to make sure that that district employee has. All right. And again, um, if you go through the different core, once you do install that mass um, change in the module, then you can just go kind of go through the core and, or, and you can find out what um, mass change is under, like payroll items. Um, that's another one that mass change is um, under. And that one can be very handy under payroll items to change 
um, add stop dates to deductions. Deductions, I'm doing classic term, payroll items. Um, you can change maybe a city um, tax percentage change. You can also use the mass change to do that under here. So mass change can be used for a lot of different options. And my computer is running a tad bit slow right now. There it is. So like I said, if you needed to change, like a mass change, um, if you would search for all the 003, and that is very, um, make sure that you have your code entered what you want to change under that mass change first. So now we know we have all those employees that want to change. And then when you, change, when you click on that mass change, you can see the percentage over here in the grid is 1.6. So if you wanted to change that to 1.5, you have that option. And what you would have to do is find that rate, and you can change it to 1.5. And then what you would, could do is do the execution mode. And as you see here, underneath, you see 325 payroll objects will be modified. So if you got a roundabout number that you know that this is what it's supposed to change, then you have, um, you can make sure that that's the number you have. And then we'll go ahead and do submit changes. Let's keep our fingers crossed that it changes. And it did. And it said 325. You could see a little pop up there, popped up, said 325 were changed and I had no errors. So again, this is more like um, a mass change in um, classic. So again, you can do different options in here to change different, and you can just do clear definition, and you can start over and do another code if you, something else changes. Um, so again, we won't take too much time because this would be more of an um, intermediate um, session for training, but I just want to say, just let you know that that mass change option is out there. Okay. So let's go on to ACH. All right. Before we get on to the ACH, there is one thing I want to show that we do have that archive option out there now, which is located under certain core options. So like the first one that I would want to say would be your compensations. So now you have the option to hide compensation so you don't see every compensation for an employee, which used to be a job. So now you have that option to hide O's on the grid so you don't see everything anymore. You don't have five jobs listed for employee that they may not use anymore. But you also have the option to bring them back if you do include archived. And as you can see, it brought in employees that I have had hidden, and it brought them back. Now, if I unclick it, they go away. So again, if you hide a compensation, what it's going to do, and this is where you see it right here, next to the supplemental tax option, and if you archive that employee and save it, and Nick Darlene for job position two is no longer there. But if I include it, and our, is it Nick? Can't think of what it is. Maybe I got the wrong name. I couldn't remember what, who I hid. Um, then once you bring up the include archive, then that person comes back in. Um, Certain um, feel or certain options that it hides from compensation. So if you hide the compensation, this is also going to hide that job from new contract. So if you try to pull in that employee and that contract is hidden, it's going to hide it in new contract. It's going to hide it from attendance also. Current and future. And also it's not going to show on the payroll processing pay report. So just let you know on those. Um, if you hide an employee altogether, um, this is actually going to hide it from all core options. So that means um, 
any, once you hide, once you go in there and say, I don't want this employee anymore on my, on my grid, I don't need him, he's gone, you can go ahead and um, employee archive. And you're gonna find that under general over here to the second next to between marital status and eligible for retirement. So you would just go ahead and click that employee archive and save. And now this employee is going to be any, any core option that this person might have, payroll items, um, pay distributions, leaves. It's going to hide it from all, all those, okay? Um, you also have the option to, under job calendar, to hide job calendars. You also have the option to hide a pay group. So if you just click on edit and say, this, I don't want to see this uh, calendar anymore. You can archive it and it will be taken off of your, of your grid. Um, also goes for pay group. Those can be hidden. And also when you want to see them again, you can either go back in here on click it and then it will be back on your grid. Or you can just do include archive here at the top. Oh, sorry, I did not see where the power post uh, is posted. Um, that would be out there where, let's see, be under the SSD redesign training materials. Let's see, maybe I can put the, what, the link here. I put the link there, so hopefully maybe that will help. Um, and also I had a question from Sharon. Um, can you say again what the hidden compensation record is hidden from? Sure thing. Um, the hidden compensation, that's gonna hide it from new contracts. So if you're trying to pull in this employee for that compensation, for that um, compensation number, it's gonna hide it from that in new contract. It's also gonna hide that employee from attendance for that compensation. Also current and future. So you're trying to bring in that employee and you're like, why can't I see this employee in current and future? Well, that's why, because check to see if this employee's compensation is archived or hidden. And also um, the payroll processing pay report, which it wouldn't be on there because he is archived. So, so I, tried to, I tried to go in there and try to test each one to see what is it hiding from? And this is the ones that I found, okay? You're welcome, Sharon. Okay, so um, we are in pay group. Um, the other one is payee. And this is another one where they can archive. So if you have many payees and you just wanna get rid of some of these, don't delete them, just hide them. That way you always have them. And again, all you have to do is go in and edit and down here at the bottom and just archive it. And then it's off your grid and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay, and again, if you want to see what is all included or every pay you have even included, then make sure you just click the included archive at the top. Okay. Um, some other things for the include archive employee on the grid. Um, there's some other ones that you can go ahead and actually archive. Um, and what you would do to bring those in employees that have been archived um, on those other screens that we just talked about, about, you can actually just click on the include archived and this will bring in those employees that are archived. So you can see, maybe you're looking and you can't find one and say, oh, okay, maybe it's archived. I wanna click include and then search that employee's name. And then if it comes up then, then you know, yeah, he's archived. I gotta go into employee screen or compensation and get him on, on um, unclick him to bring him back in. And so another one would be those um, options where you would could bring include archive. You can just click on those. That would be like your EMIS entry screen. That's another one. Um, employee personnel, your leads, your payroll accounts, your position and position personnel, your paid distributions. So these are those options where you can just go ahead and click at the top and then those employees will get pulled in that are in included archived. So you can see if they are archived or not. Okay. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and we'll get started on our core. Okay, ACH destination is our first one. So our AC destination, um, this is your baking institution routing numbers. So, um, 
when a district is pulled over from classic, this usually is all already included. So really, if you only if you have a new employee that comes in with a new routing number and a new bank, then you would have to go in here and create that for the employee, adding the routing number and the description. So this would have to be done for each bank that you have or each employee that has a bank. So you want to make sure that's done. Um, And this is, um, if you want to just view it, you can delete them. Um, and also what we have found out from Classic during the importing is in order for these descriptions to come over from um, Classic, they have to make sure in the de deduction screen, the 700 deduction screen for that em those employees, if they have to be using that because this used to be route screen, as you remember, for you classic people. Route screen, this is what this would be. So they had to make sure in the 700, they have to make sure they're using the X reference in order for those descriptions to be coming through. If they don't use that X reference in the 700 screen, then those descriptions are not going to come over. And we have that in the appendix for um, post or pre, make sure. If you do use and you want those descriptions to come over, they have to make sure that they're entered in the 700 for each employee um, for that uh, X reference. Because we had some questions that people were saying, well, the X reference didn't come over. We have it out there in route screen, but why isn't it coming over? Well, that's why, because the system is looking in the 700 saying, nope, you're not using this X reference, so we're not gonna bring over the, the description. So that is just um, to bring aware to you. <clears throat> and again, that is in the appendix and that's underneath uh, the pre-post or pre-importing. We did add that just recently. Okay. Um, the next one is your ACH source. Oops, sorry about that. There we go, a little pop-up. Okay, ACH source. Okay, this is used to create your informational records for the school. Um, this would be like your ACH or HSA files. So every district maybe just has one and they have everything coming out of one bank account. Maybe, you, maybe a district has one or two, two, maybe two or three set up. This is where they would need to have that because you can, you can pick when you're printing checks or printing um, payee checks or they can choose what account do they want these to come out of. Okay, so so this is our payroll ACH transfer data. Um, if they need to create a new one, you would just go ahead and create the file. Again, this should all come over from when they are imported in from Classic. Now, if they're a whole new district just coming into redesign um, into our estate software, then yeah, all this would need to be set up. And again, we have documentation on that. And this is pretty much mirrors what Classic was when setting up um, the information, they would have to get this from the bank, all this information, and then they would have to choose, what am I setting up, payroll ACH or HSA? So that's what this would be for. And that would be your DER maintenance, I believe, back in Classic. <clears throat> so this is what, in order for the bank to create um, the tape files, um, so they can view the direct deposit ACH. Okay, and again, we have that in the ACH source chapter under um, USP um, in the manual. And in the PowerPoint, we do have that wiki link there for you. Okay. Um, and again, in order for an ACH source, they can give this to certain permissions, to certain roles to the employees in the district. So they would have to have um, USB manager ACH source permission, and it's defaulted if they already have the grant group manager role. So just a reminder on that. Okay. Um, again, um, you can just view, if you need to view it, you can edit it from here if they need to go ahead and edit, if the number may be changed, and they also can delete it. 
And every time you do try to delete, it always comes up with a confirm message first. So you accidentally hit it, it's not going to automatically delete it audit right away. You actually have to confirm the deletion. So you can say, oops, no, I didn't mean to hit that. So you can just cancel right out of there. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to adjustments. Adjustments is probably going to be one of our longer ones. <clears throat> and this is would be what used to be in classic would would on their federal 001 record and they had those certain fields health insurance or they had um, non fringe benefits um, certain ones like that this is where these are now located well we'll see here Okay, here we go. So here is our adjustments now. <clears throat> and actually adjustments will actually hold what was imported over to for payroll items. So there's another thing to look at and it will actually say imported. <clears throat> okay, so just to kind of go through, you have your option to view it, to edit and to delete it. Um, if they're imported over from Classic, you cannot delete them. They they are there, so you would have to do an adjustment. But if they're ones that you did actually create it yourself and redesign, then you're able to actually delete them. <clears throat> so let's just say we're going to create one. <clears throat> and a new option that we put out here um, the last couple of months is this new Create New and Close, which is in the top left. Um, there is a f different options under the core that have this that you can create this. I believe um, one might be payroll items. I think it's employee, maybe compensations. Um, you can actually, so if you have adjustments to do for multiple employees and you don't want to like create one and then save and then go back in and edit, create, you can create, click this new create new. So now it will stay open and you can just continue, save it and then go in and enter, go in and select a new employee and keep continuing and then when you're done you can just cancel out so let's just say um we'll look like federal 001 so we need to make some adjustments for their w2 for the year because we missed uh adding these in the current and future um like i said ones that have been known to classic in the 001 this is where those fields are located now like your health insurance your moving expense taxable benefits your fringe benefits life insurance that would be your NC1. Um, adoption assistance, which is, I believe, is your NC3. And I'm trying to get a list here. Don't have a list. Third party sick pay. Again, that would be at the end of the year for W2. Dependent care, vehicle lease. So those are the ones um, where those are located now. So this is where you would actually add those if you need to make an adjustment or something was missed before the last pay of the year, this is where these need to be entered. And again, we have that in documentation that shows those adjustments. So if you have any questions on those, I'll bring my power part over here. This is where you would find that under core and adjustments. And these are local and this tells you everything um, if it was entered before, what, what are these going to affect? What is the fringe benefit going to affect? Because sometimes when we were in classic, we had to do adjustments to different um, year-to-date figures because it didn't do everything for you. Here in Redesign, it actually is more, the, it does more of the updating for you and you don't have to do any adjustments. So we try to pull and list each one of those so you know exactly when it's time and you have questions, please look at the documentation. If you have questions, please call us and we can help you through that. Okay, so the next thing is the total growth. So these actually have these options, total growth. So this, what these will do is actually update any payroll item. So any payroll item, it will let, you can adjust the total growth selected. You can adjust the applicable growth which is used to be taxable growth, and now they call it goal and redesign. Amount withheld. So when you choose these figures, choose these options here, that's what these are going to do. 
And again, if total gross, I don't want to, if I want to change it just for year to date, you can do that. You can deselect all these and say, nope, I just want the year to date on total gross changed. Or the applicable gross isn't right for taxable for somebody. Then you can go ahead and click on the applicable gross and change those. Okay. Um, the applicable annuities, this was brought over, was created for some issues that they were having from classic import into redesign for some um, districts that they had to create this because the W-2 wasn't correct when they were running it. And really, we don't use this as of, um, I don't think anybody has used it since. Um, so they had to add it just because of that. So that really, um, we won't go over that. <clears throat> The board amount of payer items. So if you have a payer item that's board amount and you need to change something, that's what this would be used for. Um, the earned income credit amount, um, again, that's probably something that was brought over from Classic and, and, and as of right now, that's not being used. Um, additional withholding amount. So maybe you have additional withholding amount on federal that needs to be changed. <clears throat> it's not correct. So what that will do is correct the um, the total on the payroll item. So the additional withholding amount wasn't correct. So I got, I got to correct that in order for that to show correct on the W-2. So that's what that is, and that will correct it on the payroll item also. Um, the Ford uh, fiscal to date board amounts for retiree, rehiree, and retiree. Um, if you remember um, on our classic for, uh, maybe it was 450, 590, um, they used to have that retiree, if they were rehired, they had those um, boxes, those fields underneath. Um, as of right now, these are behind the scenes, so you can't see them. And we have a juror issue out there to add those to the payroll items. So you can see if an employee is retired and they have retire, or, um, a 450, uh, 400 record, you'll be able to see those fields under there. <clears throat> and right now, so these are behind the scenes. You cannot see them. So... And again, we have a jury issue because we told the programmers, I think that'd be nice if they can bring those fields back because that's what was in classic and we we're used to seeing those. Um, the ODGS total gross, um, the classic people under the 002 state um, payroll item, there used to be an ODGFS total gross. So when you ran ODGFS, that's where this was pulled from. So again, if you run it and redesign the ODGS report, um, it's behind the scenes. You cannot see it. But if you need to make an adjustment to their gross for that report, you can use this, adjust their gross to what it should be, rerun the ODGFS um, report, and that will change those figures on there. So that's what this for. And again, this is another one that we asked the programmers if we could bring back and show underneath the O2 state record um, in the payroll item, which used to be dead screen, um, so, so uh, districts can see that field. And so they wouldn't have to run the report every time, making sure it's correct, and then do the adjustment, rerun the report again. Um, so at least they can go into their record and just see it right away, um, that field. ODGF weeks, again, if they need to make, they run the ODGFS, they look at all the employees' weeks, and they're like, oh, this one's off. This is where they would have to go in and do their ODGF week. So again, this would have been done under attendance screen in Classic. So now you go to adjustment journal, create the weeks, and then do your adjustment here for that employee. The SERS retirement, SERS retirement hours, STRS days, and STRS hours. So if you need to correct the days for the reports, um, maybe you need to add um, days for um, an employee, this is where you could do, you could do that. <clears throat> so again, you can um, add their hours and days here. So adjustment days would need to be added. So this is where you would do that. So you would do, it used to be ADRE and ADRH, I believe. So now you would have it here under adjustments instead of doing an attendance screen. Uh, EMIS attendance, again, this is a behind the scenes field um, because now we don't have an option to run reports like we used to when we were running your EMIS information for the year. Um, everything is ran straight to the SIF data collector 
and then they get error reports back and then your district probably comes to you saying what are these errors how can i fix them um, so if they have to create new emis um, attendance or absence um, reports um, they can do this is where this would be um, fixed <clears throat> again behind the scenes because we have no options right now to run in any of the emis collection stuff you don't get to see it as of right now like we used to it's all just directly picked up and sent right to Ceph. Uh, boards pick up amount of payroll. So if you're working with a payroll item that's board pick up amount of payroll item, this is where you could do this. You can fix it and then this would correct it on the payroll item screen for a board pick up amount. Um, advanced sick leave use. Um, this is if they need to change the advanced sick leave um, on their leaves account on the leaves under core, um, this is where they can um, adjust. I believe. I gotta look. There's so many different options now. Yeah, to reset the employee's advanced use on the core leave screen. So if they need to reset that advanced leave that was used on the employee screen, this is what the, we, we, um, the program's created. So now districts can go in there and adjust that if they need to. And our last option is health reimbursement. So again, um, that one should be probably up here with these, but we didn't get that. They didn't move it up there to that. So that's part of the old one record that, um, that that should be up here with under these. So just don't forget about that. It's just way down here at the bottom. So, so um, I just wanna create one. So you can just see um, how, let's see. I'm just gonna say $100 for Fringe. And then if I click Save, and you see it didn't close. It just came right back up. So now this employee is still up. So what you gotta make sure, if you're moving to a new employee, you gotta go over here and make sure you select your next employee. If not, if you forget to do that, and then you're continuing on thinking you're on a different employee and you're selecting different options, um, you're going to be making it for the same employee. So it does not clear out that employee. So just double check that you're always, they're always coming in here and selecting the next employee to make the next thing. So once they're done, or if they just want to um, create one adjustment and then actually have it just close all together, that is another option. So, so if I just $100 moving and if I click save, and it automatically closes. So it just depends if you have multiple to enter at one time or you just have one employee, then you can use that create and close. You save some time from going back and forth out of the screen, like here you would have to go back, click create and do it again. So this is the option that was created and option that is available under certain um, other um, core menu options also. Okay, so does anybody have any questions on the adjustments. Okay. Also, um, kind of thing that I did forgot when I was going through the first two is the report. Um, the, the, the districts can run reports directly from the grid. They can run them through um, any page size that they want. PDF common, or a format, excuse me. Um, CSV, um, Excel. Excel data, or if they need to do pull a grid to change this and then do an import um, to mass change something, or not mass change, but USB, can't think of what I want to say, to change fields for um, a mass load, yes. Um, then the Excel field names is what they should change. Now, they're still working on trying to get the exact header names to pull over when you're pulling from the grid, making the changes in the spreadsheet and then re-importing it, reloading it back in to make the changes. Um, I know there are some fields that are not correct and then you still have to change them. So that's something in the future that they are gonna work on and they're gonna change so that way you could just pull using the Excel field names, pull that spreadsheet, make those changes and import it back in. And you won't have to worry about getting import um, error saying, oh, header not right. So they are working on that. It's just 
they got some other things ahead of that. And again, if you run into issues and you're like, I just can't get this to import, what, what we ask, we, we usually do ask the programmers and they do help us because it is some of the fields we're, we're not sure and they can look it up right away and say, oh, this has to be this field column name and then we can change that. So, so just let you know on that. Um, so yeah, so they can create different um, report options by just um, clicking that. Now, if they want um, more columns to show, then they would go to the more option. And here you can click on posting. And sometimes what I do, if I, I try to open all these up sometimes if I'm searching, and then I do a control find, and it's just a control F, and then I go ahead and I search for month end. And then that saves me going through all this. I know sometimes it's hard because there's so many different ones that to open up, but sometimes I just go ahead and open them up if I can't find them. And then I search. And then it saves me time because that highlights everything that I'm looking for. So I don't know if that'd be a little helpful tool to you. So you can add any of this stuff if by clicking checking. And then exit out, there it is. And now it's added to your grid. It has to re regroup itself here. All right, so now it's added. So now you can move your you can move these over anywhere you want in the grid. So now I just moved it over. So um, again, you can add as much as you want to the grid using the more option. And the more option in the report is uh, um, pretty much available for every core option under here. Um, again, if you don't, once you did that, you played around the grid and you're like, I want it back to where it was, hit the reset. Reset sets you back to the grid that you had. It's the default grid that was um, created for each core option. So it just removes everything you just put in there and puts everything back to where it should be. So you do have that option to just reset it back to your default. So I just wanna let you know on that. Uh, the advanced query, we're not gonna go through that right now because that is another data tree procedure that used to be classic. Um, that's again, another IT, or uh, probably more of an intermediate section. Um, and maybe we'll go over that if we have time um, after the, uh, the third day. But again, we'll probably just leave that go for right now. Okay, any questions on what we've had so far? Okay. Let's see, we are into attendance. Okay, so our next one would be attendance. Okay. So this would be how to create, um, to track, add and update your um, attendance and absence. Now in, in Classic, you had a tenant screen and you did everything from there. You did your adjustments for retirement days, EMIS days. Like I said before, in adjustments that we were just in, that's where those adjustments are now done in. Here in attendance, it's only, um, adding and updating employees, attendance and absence. So your sick, your vacation, your personal, um, professional days. Um, this is where this is done. So again, if you need to, you can create one or you can do the mass add. So here, if by clicking create, you can either copy a row. So if you wanted to copy and then you just wanted to change the activity date, you could have done that or you can um, add a row, so, or you can delete here at the far end. So you say you just wanted to make an, a for one activity date, and it was one, well, hopefully this person has a uh, sick. So if he, this employee doesn't have a sick, um, a leave that he is available, eligible for, it will let you know. And then also you can do a subcategory. You can put in your appointment type. If it's a pay date, effective pay date, you say, um, I don't want this to take effect until later, until the next payroll, you can actually do that. 
and also you, um, and also from here, you can also do your post, current, and future. So if you do post, current, or future, you can say um, if it was an attendance and you want to get paid. So let's just save this first. Yep, this person is not eligible for sick leave. And it will give you an error message right there so you know if this person needs to be um, added. So you would have to go to their position, add um, the eligible sick leave there, or to be eligible for sick leave, and then you would have to add a leave screen for this employee. So there's certain steps that you would have to do. Um, but it, like attendance, you have the option to, for attendance or substituting. So I'm going to say, I want to post future. Click save. Okay, so now you have an attendance record created for this employee, and also I'm going to pay this employee for this work. And you can see post selected records to future. If you did the current, it would say current, or you can just cancel out and say, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I just want to add an attendance record, and that was it. So the attendance record's already posted, but it's just confirming that you want to do a post to future. So if I do post to future payroll, one record posted to future payroll. So now this employee actually has his attendance and also has his future record and you one step is done. And also that was in classic also where you could do the attendance, post to future or current. The only thing it doesn't do is take you over into future because we had the option in classic where you could post directly or you could just post and it didn't show the future or you could do uh, which is post direct or I couldn't remember I can't remember the classic terms anymore um, or you could post and it would take you into future and from there you can make sure oh I want this to be a miscellaneous not a regular so now this employee is in future so if we go over here to payroll and under future hope I can remember what the employee's name is here and I don't remember her. Was it Hunter? I don't remember. I can't remember who the employee was that I selected. Um, I wonder if it was Megan. Because it will come over, I believe, as a regular. Autumn. It was Autumn Wood. That's who it was. And see how it came over as a regular? That's the only thing is if you want them to be miscellaneous, you have to go in there and you're going to have to change that to a miscellaneous then. So it depends if that's a quicker way for you to do that instead of doing um, attendance and going over into future and added it or doing it this way. So again, it's, it depends how the district wants to handle that. Okay, so let's go back to attendance. Okay, so again, um, that's how you would create. Now, if you want to do a mass add, so maybe you have substitutes. Um, we had this in, in Classic where you could do a mass add for an employee. So you would click your employee, find what position, and either it's taking a while to load or there just isn't anybody, isn't anything there for that person. And you'll be able to see, if it has more than one job, see how they all come up. So you'll be able to select. Okay, so I'll, I'll just select this. And it's one length um, attendance. This is a substitute that came in. And so you could do substituting if you wanted to do that. You can click what category this employee was. And again, if you wanted to add a pay date, if it's for a later date. And again, you can add the substitute. Who did this employee substitute for? What teacher? Um, if the if this school um, works weekends or has weekends, you can include weekends for your chart or exclude them. And again, you can go back if you're if the district's still in maybe February payroll, but it's um, it will switch over to what month we're actually in. So right now we're in March, so it's in March. Even though I'm still in February payroll processing, it's it's going to take you right to that month. So once once we hit April, then it's going to click over to April. So you might have to just click back and they might have to add the, the days there. So they can actually do a start date, end date from here if they want. If they just want to add, okay, that he gets the full two weeks, 
so they can add that. Or you can just go down here and click on the dates. So five days are selected. Do I want to post this directly to current and future? Just like we did when we created the one. It's just going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to post our attendance records and post it directly to future. But again, you got to remember that it's going to post it as a regular and not a miscellaneous. Okay. And then if you uh, want to start over, clear the dates. So that will clear everything on here. So I'm just going to leave mine on there and we will. And this is for a Stuart. So let's go ahead and create. Let's see if we. Let's me and get no errors. Oh, I did. And she added, and there's my five days. And then I click the X button, get out, and here's my five. So it would look, if you went into classic attendance screen, it would show exactly the same way. So again, that can be used for any of your bus subs, your teacher subs, cook subs. Um, mass ad probably will save you a lot of time than doing creating one at a time. Or again, like I said, if you wanted to, you can just copy enter one enter one um, attendance for an employee, and then just copy the row. And every time you copy the row, it's going to copy exactly what you have entered up here. But you just go ahead and change the activity date. So you just got to remember you go down and change the activity date for each row that you copied. Okay. Um, the plus again, what I said here, the plus is just adding a row, and actually, um, and so it's either adding or you can just copy what you put in there. Okay, um, let's see, again, you have the report, more options. Again, you can do your include archived is here. So anybody that is archived, um, you can pull those employees in. That's probably, must be pretty big, it's taking a while. So again, you have that option. Okay. Um, if, you, if you see these down here that um, maybe down in the middle of the screen, these are the ones, um, I believe these are ones that have been imported and you cannot delete the ones that have been imported, I want to I want to say. So that's why you cannot see these. You can view them, but you can't modify them or delete them from Classic. Okay. Let's see, anything, I think we went through everything with uh, attendance. Okay, yes we did, so attendance. So if you don't have any questions on that, we'll go ahead and we'll move over to the next core option, which is our bank account. Okay, bank accounts. Um, this would be to create a bank account record. Um, every bank has one, um, one bank account to create. So you, have, you could have um, three bank accounts. Bank account at one, you have your default and what the start, you can add a start and stop date. So this is your district bank account information. Um, again, we have a new option here, so if a um, a district has three different bank accounts that they use, um, and you and each bank will have one default bank account. And whatever bank account they use the most, it will be highlighted in green. And you would check this little box here. And I don't know if I can uncheck it since we only have one. Yeah, probably, I don't, probably won't let me. Yeah, since we only have one. But if we had two, um, one would not be highlighted, and then one would be. And this is how, so we're going to, if we want to change it and say, nope, I don't want number bank account one to be our default anymore, we want number two, then you would go down and check the box and then the number two bank account would be highlighted then. And this one would be the one, every time you're running a check, um, it would come up first. But you do have the option from the drop down boxes when you're creating checks to create or to um, select a different one. So you have the option to view it, you have the option to do edit, and you have to delete it. And again, down here at the far left, um, it does say that the check mark is for make default. 
but again, you can hover over it too. Okay. So, so that would be your bank account and bank account number, which um, how many different ones you have. So the next thing would be, and this would be for processing payments. So, so anyone that would be uh, like underneath your, when you're processing payments would be your checks, your direct deposits. So this is where the, uh, this would come into play when you're um, printing those. Okay. Compensation. Okay, compensation. This would be like what it used to be in classic, it used to be job screen. So you, your compensation defines what your position is, is going to be. Um, so in order to have, to be able to create a compensation, you have to have a position created first. So position created, then you come and create your compensation. So your contracts, the all compensation grid shows everybody, your contracts and your non-contracts. So your non-contracts would be like your, um, your um, coaches, maybe your supplementals. Um, your contract compensations would be your teachers, people that um, work throughout the year, your supervisors, your secretaries. Um, that would be your contracts. Now the non-contracts again would be your supplementals. So the compensation would define what your position is. So, so maybe um, contract compensations, that would be employees that have a specific amount that is paid to that person during a payroll period. And non-contract compensation would be on maybe an unknown, unknown total amount. So uh, a sub doesn't, we don't know what a sub's gonna get paid and not the same amount every week. So um, they might get paid $10 an hour. We know that, but we don't know what hours they're gonna work. So they would be a non-contract compensation. Um, and then again, a compensation can be created for every position you have. So if you have a teacher or a employee has five positions, you can create five compensations. Um, when you create a compensation, um, you actually can create, um, I don't know, I don't think I have an employee that I don't have anything that I can, but if maybe I'll see if I'll just create a non-compensation for this secretary for position two. Um, you can, um, this is kind of what a non-contract compensation looks like. Um, from here, once you already created the non-contract, you can't change the type. So if you accidentally um, was supposed to be a contract, you would have to cancel out and, and delete it and just start over. You can't just go down here and change it. Um, the job calendar, you can choose what job calendar they're on. Mine says weird things because it's a, um, a district that is anonymized. So um, we have weird names for um, like headphones. Um, you can add a description, um, your label. Um, a label can be used to um, show either on your grid here, if it's a 1920 contract, if it's gonna be a 2021 contract, um, just to help out the districts so they know what, what contract am I looking at? If they have three showing, um, they can label that and they can pull that up on the more option and then they can see that in the grid and say, oh, okay, this is their old 1718 contract. Um, you know, if they don't have them hidden in the archive, of course. Um, compensation start and stop date. Now, if it's a non-contract, um, they usually just have a compensation start date because it's not looking at a job calendar at that time. Because usually a job calendar for non-contract, they're usually on a default. So they just make sure, and they maybe have a start compensation. Um, a pay plan, um, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, it depends what the district is. Um, the unit amount, is this employee gonna be paid daily or hourly? Um, and then here where they can enter a unit amount, maybe the employee gets paid $50 a, a day for teaching, or maybe it's hourly. And then they would put in um, it's an hourly wage, and then they put in $7 an hour. 
um, SRS supplemental. Here they can change it. Applies to annuity supplemental, annuities regular, or none. So this is where if they want to apply their annuities and they want to pay them, um, this supplemental job is going to be paid differently. So because it's going to apply the annuities differently, this is where that selection would be. So the system knows to apply the annuities to the supplemental or apply the annuities to the regular job and not the supplemental. Um, under compensation amount, these would automatically be filled in. So these you cannot modify. Anything in this uh, grayish blue um, is not modifiable. And these will get updated every time the payroll is paid, the, people, um, the employee is paid through the payroll. And then the historical content, this is your job calendar um, date, and then you can enter a calendar start date. And again, um, you don't ever add a calendar stop date. Um, if it was a compensation where the calendar date, it goes off a job, then they would need this calendar start date entered. Once the employee is done, then they would enter the calendar stop date um, once the employee is no longer employed. The pay group. Um, again, the pay group will come over from the position. So like I said, you have to create a position first, and then you come to compensations and create a compensation for that position. And then when you're, when you're bringing that over, that automatically brings over your pay group and the pay group description. So if it needs to be changed, you would have to go to that position first for that employee, change that pay group, and then come back to the compensation, and that will update this field right here for you. You cannot do it here in the compensation. And then the state reporting, is this a reportable EMIS? Usually, um, I guess teacher, yeah, uh, subs can be, I guess, reportable to EMIS. Um, and also down here, you have the option now to compensation adjustments. Um, this is something that's recently been added, probably last month or two maybe, or it's, maybe it's been longer than that already. Um, we, they were wanting were um, amount paid, amount earned, amount docked. They want to be able to update those fields because they weren't able to before. So now they can by going to the compensation record, going down to compensation adjustments and do the create. And then these will update those fields for you. Okay. And then we want to make sure you have a date in there and then you can do a description. So now you're able to adjust these fields under compensations that we couldn't, where I said they were highlighted in the blue and you cannot change them. And now you can. Okay. And then once you created that employee, you could just click save. Um, if it was a actual employee for a, just a normal compensation contract, just go ahead and you can see the difference between the fields then. So here is a contract. So this would be, like I said, for your teachers, um, your full-time bus drivers um, that have a calendar. So you would see here, this is where your job calendar would be. Um, again, you cannot ch change the type. So if you accidentally created the wrong one, you have to cancel and delete it and start over. Um, description and label. Um, and here, you would definitely want a compensation start and stop date. Um, this is something different because how the system calculates is looking at that job calendar and saying, okay, from this start date to stop date, this is how it's um, counting for their days. So again, for a contract, you need to have your start and stop dates. That's what um, will calculate your contract days worked, or excuse me, contract work days. That's what this is going to, the far right one here. And again, you can't, you can't change those. Um, again, you have the same options as the non-contract. You have your pay plan, your pay unit, um, your unit amount. And again, um, they added this override unit and amount. And you can, they can override if they're th thinking that, um, I don't like what the computer is calculating. I don't want it to be this amount. I want it to be this amount click the override unit amount calculation and you can enter in the calculation that you want. And it also has that override pay per period calculation. And that's what that's used for. Because some districts are like, no, it's off by $10. It's just not calculating what I want it to be. So you, they can override it and put in what they want. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but the option is out there. 
um, retirement hours. So we want to make sure if there are SERS employees that retirement hours get entered in there. Um, if they were in STRS advance, right now it's on check, but once they are put into advance, this will get checked and it would be marked. Just like in the job screen where it would on the far left at the bottom on the second screen, it said STRS advance. Um, this is what this is now. So it would be a here under the pay unit. So if you want to see if there's STRS advance and there's, if they're in it or out it, you would go here. Again, you have your supplemented tax option to change if you want to. However, that should be taxed. And again, you can archive. This is where you would archive the employee or the contract. And also, how many hours in the day? So that would need to be filled out too. If they're seven and a half, they need to have that entered in there. For your contract, your pay per period, this all gets um, calculated automatically. So when you do the save, it's going to calculate from what you entered and it's going to let you know. Again, like I said, once that's calculated and you're like, that's not what it should be, um, they can go ahead and override that if they like. Now, the contract amount, contract application that would need to be entered when creating it, um, how many pays in the contract. Um, they also have an option if they need to do a retro next pay. So they can go in here just like in job screen. It was in the middle of job screen on page two. It was that retro next pay. We don't have a doc next pay like we used to in Calc Classic. We only have retro next pay. And then also stretch pay. So this would give them a stretch pay of the same pay every every pay. Don't matter how many days they're paid in the in the week, if they're going to automatically get the same pay. So it's going to pull it from accrual or going to put money into accrual and get that money back. And it just depends how many days they work in their contract. So teachers, they're going to get money from their accrual and it's going to put in their accrual account. So that way over the summer months, they'll have a summer pay. But people that work the full year through the summer, they'll get the same pay, but the, the money is always just being kind of put in accrual and taken. So you always get that same amount every pay. So that's what your stretch pay is doing. Your accrued wages. This, again, is going to update every time the employee is paid. And again, if you want to change that, you have that option down here under create. You have amount paid, amount earned, amount docked, your pay is paid, days worked, and you got to make sure your date is correct. So you do have that option to change these figures now, which we didn't before. Um, your salary schedule. Now, I know uh, um, some have asked, are we going to have, like we did in Classic, the salary schedule? We do not. But if they had it loaded in Classic, if they had it import, uh, um, already inputted in their screens, and they were using those salary schedule fields, I think they're in job screen, they will pull over and import in, and they will be here. So they will have that information there. It's just there's nothing right now that uses it. No report, no program um, that uses that those fields. So um, they can use a spreadsheet and every year update so they can keep track and say, okay, um, we need to um, up, up the teachers to the next step. They can do that by a schedule. Um, I have a question from Sharon. Can a salary schedule fields be added to a non-contract compensation record also? No, they cannot. Um, they're only as of right now, they're only added to contract. Um, we did have that question, and if, if there's something that you guys do want to see, um, please send out a ticket, and we can include it in a feedback. And there might be a feedback ticket out there, Sharon, for that, because I know somebody else asked that a while back. Um, but as of right now, no, no contract on conversations, just on, uh, just on contract. OK, good question, though. That was very good. Um, state reporting. We have the reportable to EMIS. So again, um, pretty much contract and teachers. Anybody that, that's reportable will need to be make sure that is marked so they get included on the EMIS when they send their data collector in and they get sent in. Historical content. Um, calendar. You always want to make sure that they have a calendar start date. Just like in Classic on Job Screen, we always wanted the calendar start date and we never wanted to mess with it. Like in Job Screen, we always wanted to leave it as soon as what they started is what the date. And only time you had a calendar stop date is when they are let go, done, they retired, then you enter a calendar stop date. 
The contract change extension type, this field would only be populated is if you're doing a mid-year contract change. So if you have a mid-year contract change, say employees are getting a raise and they finally, the union finally decided on it and it's two months in, then you do a mid-contract contract train, you import those in, then when you go into that contract, you this will populate and say, this contract came over from a mid-contract retro over remaining pays. That's how this compensation was created. So if it was just a new contract created on new contract, or um, just uh, you like I'm doing right now, it's not going to do anything. But it will if you're moving it from creating it pulling it into new contract, doing the retro pay, re-importing it in, and it will show here. So it might be helpful to districts so they can see how was this contract created? Where did it come from? All right, pay group, again, pay group comes over from position. So if they need to change that pay group, they will have to go over to this position for this compensation number, position two, and change the pay group number and then that automatically will update these fields for that uh, compensation. Okay. All right. Any questions on the compensation? Again, um, the contract, it's the all compensations will show everybody, your non and your contract. But if you just want to pull in contract compensations, then you go ahead and click the contract compensation tab and now all these employees are compass are just compensations contract compensation excuse me and then from here if you need to add different things in your grid again your more option will be your friend it has pretty much everything that you can add to your grid it just takes a little time and like i said usually what i do i open up these little tabby things and then i do a control f and then i can do i can pull in whatever I need. I found out that is the easiest way instead of searching through the scroll bar down and down. Um, we did suggest to the programmers that we want to be able to have one little tag up here, maybe one down arrow up here, and click on it and it will open up everything. Because we thought, so that hopefully is in the works in the future too, because we think that would be nice. It'll save a lot of time. Okay. And then again, you have your report option just like you do or your reset. So again, you can add, take off, anything you want to. All right, you do have the mass change option. This is one of them where that mass change option is available, which we won't go into much because this is definitely a data tree procedure, which is, um, like we said, we don't like to have districts have access to this just because it can be dangerous because it does change if you don't have the right stuff entered in. It can change anything and everybody. So it's just um, a very careful tool to use that can be very helpful and save a lot of time. So, okay. Um, and again, non-contract compensation, here's another one. And this is what your non-contract compensation. These are all non-contract employees. Okay. All right. Any questions on those? I guess 1010. Our time is flying. Okay, we're gonna move on to I'm trying to keep up on the group chat here. So if you put anything there and I don't see you right away, I kind of try to glance over there as much as I can. So Okay, date codes. Your date codes is, this is what you can create date codes and these will show on your employee screen. So once you create this, it's gonna show on this screen here for this option for employee, your date codes. So they're district defined fields. And in Classic, we used to have those. We used to call him user defined fields, same thing. But this is how these are created. So if you wanna create more fields, so like, um, I'm gonna do test. It's gonna be under, you can put it under whatever group header name you want. So once I show you, you probably get what I'm talking about, employee date CF, that's what it's, it says right now. So I'm just gonna leave it that way. And um, property name, let's just use that. So I created that. So now if I go to employee, so this is can create any kind of, field that they want for and add it. So if I go now to this employee, it should work. If I go down here, 
see this employee date CF test. So I added, I can do a date and I can also do a text in there. So I conclude, so maybe it's um, when they got their license for something. You can add that. And it could be any, any header they want. Or if they want to add more to the dates, then what they would do instead of, you know, where it said employee date CF and that one column, you would type in dates. And then when you, it, and then it knows where to go. Oh, I want to put a date under here. So if I go back there, say codes, and I'm going to create, I'm just going to, um, a date, wow. and right here, this is where you backspace and type in date. Oh, I can't remember if it was dates or dates. Can't remember. I bet it was dates. Oh, yep. Already, oh, it already exists. Uh, how about dates? Nope. You don't like you. There we go. So now, hopefully, I can't remember if it was employee dates or dates, so we'll see. Yep, it was dates. So see, it didn't pull it in because I didn't have dates in there. And it has to be exactly what that header is. So I only put date in there and it didn't pull it in. So I know now that I need to go back in there and you can edit. And that group has to be dates. So whatever that header context is and that employee screen has to be that group name in order for it to pull in. So now when I go back to employee and hit it, it will be in the crate and it will also be in anybody that's already there. So now you can see my dates field is here. And then you can put in there what it is. But you can you can create any field for employee option or add to any of these employee options. If it's if you guys the district wants to see more information for addresses and they they can add a address group and that date um, codes and add the name of it and it will show. Okay. So that can come in pretty handy if they want to keep track of more stuff. Okay. Um, EMIS entry screen. Okay, so this inf information, um, when you create an employee or a pos in a position screen, this information automatically gets created. So these e EMI entry employees automatically come over from once they create that employee. So this is something that you cannot add or create. It's just you can modify it or you can view it. Now, this would be for maybe employees that work with EMIS related information that just working on EMIS. That's all they do. Um, you can actually give them EMIS um, privileges and then they would only see certain options from the core. Excuse me. And this might be and this would be one of them. So they can go in there and always mod and they can go in there and change somebody. I mean, they can't see like payroll information, you know, things like that, just like it was in classic where they only work on EMIS. Um, information. So this would be what these screens are used for. So if you have EMIS staff. Um, so like I said, edit, this came over from the employee screen. Um, credential ID, that would also, most of the stuff will all be brought over from already. Um, so this would, like I said, it's just if they need to update certain information. So if they update information here, it's going to update the information on the employee screen also, or the position screen, excuse me. So it does catch each other. It knows how to work in between. So it knows if you're changing here, it's gonna change over there in that screen. Um, again, here you can add your uh, update experience. Um, it pulls in your birthday and your uh, specific race flags. Um, so you do have that option here. Um, as you can see here, you have the EMIS position. So your EMIS CJ records um, excuse me, your EMI century, so your employee related information is your CI. So that would be your first one, your employee entry, that's your CI records. Your position records is your CK records. And then, then you have your CJ and your CC. So your CC is your EMIS contract services or your EMIS contractor C 
CJ. And in order for these screens to show, um, they don't show automatically. So you, again, you would have to go to System, Modules. And down here, you would have to um, actually add those. If I can find them. EMIS, where are you? Oh, right at the top. Uh -huh. And you want to make sure that this is added, which I already did. And you can see by right here, it's checked, so it's installed. And so, again, in order to see those fields, you would have to go to System Modules, add those. And then when they go back to EMIS entry, then they will appear. If, they, if those modules are not installed, these two tabs would not be here. Okay. And again, um, a district can set up, like I said in the beginning, um, system under system and roles. Um, and when they go to the role here, they can actually create a role just for EMIS employees to work on that, like right here, um, EMIS read-only user, uh, EMIS user. And then what that does is brings in, um, they can only work on EMIS entry. I mean, they can create, delete, um, contracted service, state reporting. Um, again, so they are not able to view or see any other maybe personal information of the employee. So they do have the option to bring those in. So, all right. Um, I think that's it for that. Any questions on the EMIS entry screen? Let's go back there. All right. So again, um, if you click on that, um, it brings up their information for the employee. If you go to the position entry and click on edit, brings up the employee information here from the position. So you can see everything, the staff employment. So that would be just like your position screen in Classic. So that would be your um, state reporting, all that information that would have to be for a teacher. That would be all that information here is what is EMIS reportable. Okay. Now, if you have a EMIS CJ record that needs to be created, this is where you would do this. You create the record, pick the employee, position, what kind of compensation, or if they do have a compensation, and then the IRN, position code, and FTE. And then, right now, we don't have a way to for the SIF collector to actually pick that up. So you're going to have they're going to have to create those and then extract the CJ record and create a file to their desktop and then they're going to have to send that on because right now we don't have any way for the CJ records for the SIF collector to pick those up. So just a reminder that they do have to do those steps, create it and then extract it and then send it on to the SIF collector or to their you know, wherever they send their data collector to. The EMIS contract service for CC, same thing. Create the um, person, so you're gonna wanna get what their federal tax ID for that contractor, enter all in the information that they need, save it, and then again, extract the data. So when you do that, it just created down here in the FAR, and then it creates a record. So the way that can be saved, on your desktop and sent on to the data collector. Okay, is there any info, any questions on EMIS contractor information or EMIS all together? Okay, your next is your employee. Employees, so again, this actually is your first step in creating an employee. So like if Classic, um, you had steps to create an employee, this is your first step. You have to create an employee first. And again, under the appendix, I believe we have steps on how to create a new employee. What, what options under core need to be done in order for an employee to get paid? So we do have that under the appendix. And again, that is down here. 
Um, no, I think it's trackless. Maybe adding an adding an employee. So again, we do have that under. It's under the appendix, general procedures, adding an employee. And this was just recently updated, so this should be all up to date on the screens. And it tells you each screen and the option that, that has to be filled in in order for a new employee to be added. We actually added um, also for the classic that um, are still learning from classic 3 to 9, we also added that little thing like core employee that used to be bio screen and dumb screen. So uh, the core employee browse screen. We do have a replacement now for a uh, browse screen. It's the dashboard, which we'll go over that at the end here. Oh, I'm done with that. There we go. Okay, so when you create a new employee, you do create, and then this is where this starts. So then the information that you want to enter is just like you would before, I, your number, identification number, um, social security number, your number would be your um, employer ID, employee ID, credential ID, that would be for teachers. So if a teacher has a Z, or not a Z ID number, but their Ohio license, that's where this would go. Um, EMIS, you should leave that blank. You enter the name, um, legal name. Again, this is if the person goes by a different name. The real name is David, but they go by Dave. David has to be on the W-2. This is, would be your legal name. So that's where this would go. You have your address. You have your contact. You have your general status, which would be like your marital, um, eligible for retirement, your email direct deposit your gender, um, is this employee new hire reportable ODGFS? ODGFS reportable. And um, OSDI code, if they have one. Is employee part-time? Is it reportable to EMIS? Um, also, you have your birth dates. You have your dates, you have, you have your birth date, your hire date. When were they hired in? The last paid date, this will automatically update every time they're paid. So if they're looking to see, um, I believe that was on the bio screen in Classic, um, when they were last paid on the first page on the far left. And that would that's what this is now. ODJFS hire date. And you also have your termination date. And that was actually on the bio screen on the second page. So when they're terminated, and that date in so they won't get picked up for EMIS anymore. Um, that one I created. Um, evaluation, again, the users uh, districts can use this at their, to keep track of maybe when their last evaluation was, when their next one will be. Experience, um, this would be make sure that the district has, I think they would need is, and again, in our checklist, we have what should be entered, like authorized experience, principal experience, if they're a principal or total experience required. So if they are teachers or they have experience, these are required fields for EMIS. So we just put, them, we just put those as required so that way they're not forgotten when they're being added in for the new employee. And like I said, principal, again, is if just if he was a principal. The race. Um, again, they would need the race filled out. And then again, standard payroll, standard personnel, those are user-defined fields. And again, they can, um, in that date code that I showed earlier where I added that employee and the dates to be on here, they can add more fields in here or they can change these headers to what they want to be. They don't need to be personnel code one, personnel code two. They can actually, they can actually change those by going in um, by going in and changing them under custom field definition. And again, this might be if you're just starting on redesign and it might be a little um, hard to craft, but this would be where those field header names can change. And it tells you where they're applies to the employee screen. Pay distribution employer payroll item. So this is where they are and what's the property name. And see here their property name. You can change those personnel records 
right here, payroll code one, payroll code two, by just clicking on them and change them. So property name, you can change it to whatever they want. It doesn't have to be payroll code four. They can put um, a different header name in there if they want to keep track of something else. It's user defined to use for the district use, whatever they want it to be. Every district can use it. So just want to show you that. And it's probably more of an intermediate, but um, I think that'd be very useful for districts to be able to change those headers if they prefer to. And it just, like I said, it's not just employee, it's position. The position screen also has personnel date tax codes that can be changed. So the date code under core, where I showed you the first time, those are just for employee screen only, but the customer report, the customer uh, custom field definition, that can be used and changed for any of these fields that are listed here. So just let you know on that. Okay, let's go back to employee. Okay, let's go back to create. All right, so we want that state reporting. Again, if the employee um, um, is teacher, um, they're gonna have to make sure all this information is filled out. Um, if it's qualification, what kind of degree, um, if they long-term illness, remember that was on, I think bio screen or is it job screen, um, long-term illness. This is where they would have to add that for the EMIS reporting options. So um, non-certificate employee ID, this would be your Z ID number. Again, well, remember when I said credential ID, that is for employees that have a license. Now, if they are in just a, a normal secretary, non-certificate employee ID, that's Z ID number. That's where that would go. Okay. And then, okay, also if they have other credentials and semester hours. Okay, and then again, the pay totals at the bottom that will get all inputted every time they are paid, these fields will up, um, adjust. So they can go in and view this if they want to see what's the employee paid to date or what did they get paid this month. They can go in here and they will be able to see that. Okay. Um, another thing that's something new, I don't know if many districts use it, is the choose template. What they can do is create an employee like I just did here. They can add maybe create a Michigan, uh, a Michigan employee option and then they can actually so if they, um, or they can add like certain fields to populate, and that way they don't have to populate, every time they create an employee, they don't have to put in all those fields. They can actually create a template, they can save it, and I can say, okay, this is my maybe Michigan employees, just to say. Um, so they can enter all those fields in that they want, and then right now I have a Michigan default employee. So then I would just click that if I click and see how it disappears. No state. So if you want to create, you can create as many templates as you want to save time and for the districts to be entering information. They can just go ahead and create as many templates as they want and fill in what they can fill in which ones. Maybe employee may not be a good one to use. Um, but they can do that. They can, uh, payroll items, another big one maybe. Um, but they can create one for females. They can create one just for males. Um, they create one for employees that are retired, um, eligible retirement, or employees that are not email direct deposit. Um, again, it is up to the district to use this as they like. But again, it's a, a time saver for districts if they just want to be able to um, Create employee, go over here. Oh, yep, it's my Michigan employee. Everything inputs in for me. I just have to fill in, you know, the personal information of that employee. Can save you time. So that's one good thing about that, that template record right there. Okay. Um, again, you can view an employee or an edit. 
from here. Okay. And as you can see, the Hyo Crenshaw ID or they were Z ID number. So again, only license goes up here and Z ID numbers down here to the left. Okay. And again, you can um, archive. So this, even though it has an X, and if you hide or like just kind of hover over it, you can see that it archives. So again, you can hide the employee and you can hide the employee right here. You don't need to go and edit, hit the archive button, and then it's archived. You can just go right here and archive it. So if I archive it, Larson and Dustin, he's gone. But if I go and include archived, and there's my Dustin. And I don't know if I click this, let's see. I don't know if it brings them back, I bet it don't. Nope. So I would have to go back in there. Once he's archived, you can't just click on that. I thought maybe you could and just on, on archives the guy, but it doesn't. So you would have to go into the employee screen actually and go to archive. Where am I at? I've got to search for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There he is, right there, under general. Click on Employee Archive to bring him back in. So it's easier to archive employee. You can just click on it, and he's, and he's, and he's back. And there he is. So now he's in my, my grid now. Okay. Um, are there any plans to replace the word delete with archive when it is asked you to confirm? Um, you know, I, that might be a feedback ticket and let me write that down. And if not, I will create one because I think that was when during testing, that was one question that we had. So archive, not delete. Okay. And that's on the employee. Okay. Got it. Good question. I will check to make sure, see if we have a feedback ticket or a jury issue confirmed for that one. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? Nope, okay, so we're good. Any questions on the employee? All right, and again, make sure we have that out there, general procedures, adding a new employee. Okay, so the next is employee personnel record. And again, employee personnel record, this information is already created. When you create the employee, it all comes over, nothing has to be done. So all you can do is view it, that employee. View and edit. Can't create one, but you can view and edit. So again, this might be for um, EMIS people. Um, if they want to have access to the um, employee personnel and also will be position personnel and EMIS information. And again, you can select what roles they want by using the role. So again, the roles, you can select if they want to see just these screens, personnel and the position personnel, they can just see those screens and just edit those screens. That's all they can do. So again, it just brings over that information. So nothing really. And again, um, if you have an employee that wants to see these roles, you would under the role, you would choose personnel underscore role, a uh, user, excuse me. So that's how the employee would see this role only. So employee underscore user underneath your roles. Okay. The next is our job calendar. Job calendar. This would be back in classic USP DAT jobs, uh, creating job calendars. Job maintenance. Um, so from here you can create a job calendar. Uh, most of your job calendars are going to come over from Classic, but when a new district comes on to the state software and they're going straight to redesign, then this is where they would have to create those job calendars for every type of work. So um, you would have maybe one for teachers, you have one for secretaries, you have one for um, superintendents, bus drivers, um, cooks, full-time cooks, 
um, they can make as many job calendars as they prefer in the district. And, and you always have to have one default calendar and that default calendar will be used for your subs. So they will be attached to a default calendar when you are um, setting them up on their compensation. Okay. Um, to create it, you just, you could just enter in what is your calendar. Again, you can have a full list, eight digits. You can have it numbers. Um, it doesn't have to be a three digit uh, letters anymore. Um, you can add how they want to add their calendars. You can put a description in. And then you can create your, your calendar. And again, you would have to create one calendar for each one for the whole year, just like you would in, in, in Classic. And then you can use that, that copy procedure. And then you can copy those calendars and then move the dates, just how you would when we were in Classic. So like I have, a, um, I wanna copy a calendar for next year. So start date, I don't think I have one yet for 29. Let's just go all the way to the year. And I need to create a couple. So you highlight, I do a shift and then arrow down. And you can highlight, shift, arrow down. Or you can just arrow down. But if you do shift, then you can highlight all of those. So I'm going to shift, arrow down to bring those over, bring over, and copy. So now they are copied. So if I go to AX, oh no, it wasn't AXW, was it? Oh, I created calendars, and then what you can do from there is add um, the W's to them. So I probably already had calendars created for 2020, which I probably did. Um, I don't know how far I have out there. Yeah, I got calendars way out there in the future. But that's how you would create your next year's calendars. You would just, you can go ahead and, and just copy from the year before, copy what calendar, maybe your teacher's calendar, your default calendar. And then from there, um, those W's would be pulled over. And the only reason why mine are not showing now in my, because I didn't have any W's from the prior. So that's why no W's were showing on my calendar. Um, another thing, mass change. To mass change, you can say you created new calendars for the next year, but the date that they're having off is not the same date as it was last year. So you can mass change that date. You can select the date and then update it to what date you want it to move it to. So pick the date that you it was and what it should be and pick the calendars that those all have to change for, move them over and update it. So you can update all the calendars all at once. So you can do a mass change for a date. Um, also in the create, I keep bouncing back and forth here, sorry. Um, also here in the day count totals, once you create those calendars, it shows, um, it shows what, how many dates for the fiscal year, work days, how many holidays, how many climate days, how many makeup days are on this calendar for this, um, it shows for the calendar year, for the fiscal year, for the first quarter, just for March for this calendar, or if you have a custom date range. So they can go in, look at this, they can do the view, the eye, or they can, you know, just view it and they can see it. They don't have to go in the correct in there and look. You can actually do a custom start or stop date. So then like if I say I want to create um, let's just go from the beginning of the year to the 30th of 2020. And I can do work days, 
I can maybe one day, maybe it was a, um, a holiday. So we have three days off our Christmas break. So you can put the start date, you can put the end date. And be all holidays and put holiday. Or you can include weekends or not. Or you can mass and then you mass add. So I want to mass add those days. Did it work? I did test. Let me say. Why oh, didn't that work? Oh, you know what? Because I did. <laughs> I know what I did. Well, why didn't that work? Oh, 01 2020 to 06 01 Work days. Oh, maybe I wasn't done thinking. Maybe. There it is. Okay. I just, I wasn't waiting for my blue line to finish. So there, you, so now I added my, uh, mass added my days. And again, if you need to change maybe one of those day to a calendar, so if I do 08, 2020, change that to holiday, mass, and oop, let's start, oops, sorry. Can't be the same date, so let's do. So I added a holiday, maybe like I said, for three days of vacation or two days of holiday, excuse me, for Christmas. So you can do it that way too. And again, you can do that for your calamity days, your makeup days. If you have to change a work day to a makeup day, then you can just mass add. Um, mass change, again, if um, you can change uh, the date to change that date to a calamity date. You can change it to a makeup date. Because I think before I said it was date to date. Sorry about that. You can pick a date in the calendar and change it a work day to a holiday. And then you can do that for any of those days. I did say that wrong. I apologize. So this can be very handy when changing things over if uh, they had a snow day, so they moved it to a calamity day instead of a work day. Okay, any questions on a job calendar? Okay, all right, um, let's see the next. We will be working on leads. Halfway through there. There we are. Okay, so leave. So we have, this would be, once the employee is selected to have um, a leave, this is where you would create, um, you would actually create their leaves. So, but first the employee has to be eligible. So again, I guess I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit, but under position, this is where that employee you would first select when you're creating the employee's position you would have to make sure that if this employee is a teacher usually teachers get personal days and sick days that those two fields are checked and if those are only two fields that are checked that's only what's going to show on that leave so like this employee here dustin larson has eligible for personal leave sick leave and vacation leave so again, these boxes have to be marked in order for employee to have them. So actually for Larson, Dustin Larson, I'm going to add his vacation too and save. Okay. Let's go back to leaves. 
So this would be Ben screen in classic. Okay, so here's our Dustin. So now he shows vacation, sick, and personal, but you see some people only show sick and vacation. That is because in that position screen, only two of those boxes were only sick and vacation were checked. So they would only show what they are eligible for from what, does, what they marked on that position screen. Okay, so then from here, if it's a new employee, you, you select that employee, whoever the new employee is, I don't think I have one, and you continue. But if the employee already has leave, it's, it's just going to say that. But all it's going to do is open up a box like this, and then you go from here, you enter in the employee's information. So like for sick, accumulate per month, how much does the district accumulate for this employee? What is the max leave amount that once he's up to this leave, it'll stop accumulating? Daily or unit, big thing to remember, we just created a juror issue on this one, is leave unit. A lot of districts are leaving the leave unit out. They forget to, to select it, but we're gonna add an error. So when they try to save this, it's gonna say leave unit not selected. They're going to have to go and make sure they get that entered and then, and then it will save because some reports run off of that and it screws up their balances. And maybe some in this um, training probably has dealt with that. And that is why, because of this, they're leaving the un you leave unit out. But we did get the programmers to um, create a JIRA issue. So that is um, an issue that hopefully in the future will be created or be finished. So for now, just a reminder to your districts, have to make sure they have a leave unit in when they're selecting. Um, so then they want to do their balance. Actually, uh, the balance will be updated. The light blue is always something that will be updated every time a payroll is ran or if they use something. Um, max leave um, advance leave amount. So if they are going to give 10 extra max leave advance for employees, their district does that. This is where they would enter that in. And then once they go get through here and use all those, then it starts using these advanced units. And then what we'll do, we'll start showing every, every pay. Um, if they have to use those units for sick leave, it will start showing how many they're using of those 10. And then we're in adjustments where I showed you that adjustments where you can do the um, adjust max advanced leave amounts. If they want to get rid of those or add more, then you would do that. That's where you can um, add those or adjust that field. Um, advanced units use, excuse me, not the advanced max advanced leave. It would be this field, the one that you cannot um, edit here. Then you would use the adjustment option to adjust those used. You can take them back down to zero or what you need to do. Um, eligible for leave type, those are always checked if they're eligible. Not sure why they're there because if you're eligible, then you would be showing on this leave screen. Um, again, this is just back and forth. Um, this is kind of what the, when you're running a payroll on applied usage, I mean, if you haven't quite used a, it, it just shows what the, the usage is, but it hasn't been applied yet to this like balance. So it just kind of sits down here until the payroll is completed. So again, you have your personnel and your vacation. Okay. All right, any questions on that? Okay. All right, and again, um, report, you can use the report to create from the grid. If you wanna see what their balance is, you can just type in, I wanna see just six employees and I'm gonna run a report and I wanna see what their balances are. So, accumulations under the leaves. This, um, you can actually, once I get it up there, you can view, you can modify or delete an employee's accumulations. Um, this is where you can create a accumulation for an like one employee. So if an employee um, was forgotten on the list somehow, or an employee just came in and need to add, um, accumulation for them. This employee isn't eligible. Let's find one that is. There we go. Um, maybe vacation. Then you would, um, I forgot. 
something. What is the length? I'm going to give them 1.25. And the date, I believe, is going to have to be an open posted period. So whatever, I'm open in February, so I'm going to add that. So this is for Larson for 1.25 accumulation. And there is my, and there he is. And again, you can see the import from classic description. These are non-modifiable or they cannot be deleted. That option has been taken away. They can view them, but you cannot delete them. So now, since I created and redesigned, I can delete, modify, or, de or um, update it. If you need to update that and say, oop, was up 1.25, I need to give him more. I need to give him five days. You can just edit there and update it. Or maybe there was an error and he, was, he has way too many days. I need to take days away from him because I gave him way too many. You can minus, you can just minus one if you want. I mean, it's, it's whatever. Oh, minus one. There we go. And now it's a minus one. So now I took days away for his vacation. So this is how you would, um, yeah, that's just mass change. This is how you would add um, accumulation days for an employee if something was forgotten or they need to adjust a balance, take, like I said, take away or give to correct something. Okay, and um, I believe um, you used to be able to do this in jobs or in attendance screen in classic. So now it's under the core, under leaves, accumulations tab. Okay, on to the next. I think we're pretty, we're doing good on time. We have just over an hour. I'll start to speed it up here a little bit. Um, organization detail. This was what was on the USP dat con screen in classic. This is your information for your organization, your school name, your IRN, street address of the school. Um, also the county, um, federal ID, state EIN, ODJFS number, SERS code and SERS code. Again, this is all imported over from Classic when they do come in or if, when a new school comes in to redesign, they will have to make sure this information is filled out. But this is where that information is located now under or core organization detail, school information. And you can edit that. Because this information is used when we're running STRS reports, SERS reports, ODGFS, it looks at this information. So this information has to make sure the federal EIN number, everything for state for W-2 purposes, we have to make sure those codes are entered. Okay, so the next, pay distribution. Okay, this determines how an employee should be paid. Is it direct deposit? Or is it check? And it's thinking. There it is. So if we view, I'll just view one, like Dustin Larson here. Maybe. There we go. Edit. So right now he has a direct deposit set up. So most districts are all going direct deposit. So very rarely are you going to have a direct deposit, but you can do a direct deposit and check now. In classic, it had to be either or or, either check or all direct deposit. It couldn't be direct deposit and a check. So, but now they can do that. Um, I know a lot of just are, districts don't want their employees to know that because they just want to keep it one way or the other, which I understand that, but they do have that option. So if they need to edit that, they can go ahead and open that person up. They can click edit. And they can create it. Again, codes. You can use the old 700s if that's what they're used to, or you can start using something different. Doesn't matter. It can be uh, letters. It can be numbers. Um, what, is the, what is the abbreviation for it? Is it savings? Is it uh, checking? Savings one, savings two. Um, the account number for that employee. What is their direct deposit checking account number? Is it going to be percent or fixed? So percent is 100% means 100% is going into this account. But if they're going to do two accounts, maybe two direct deposits, one's going to be checking, one's going to be savings. So we're going to create two. So this one would be 
a 6% of $100. And then a start, uh, you can put a start or stop date if it's not going to start to the future, leave it blank if it's going to start immediately. And again, you still have the option to create a pre-notification um, for direct deposits to make sure their account numbers are correct. So if they're not going to get paid, but they want to be pulled in to double check their checking account number before they get paid the next time, you have that option here. Some districts don't use it. They just automatically set it to automatic deposit and that gets picked up and, and never gets checked through the bank. Again, it's up to the district how they want to do that. And again, you have direct deposit for savings and for checking. And again, you have your ACH destination. And that's where the ACH information, we, and that was the very first one I believe that we did in under core. This is where they would, you would use this because it has the routing numbers and the name of the bank. And then in the um, payroll. Which one is the payroll coming out of? What payroll ACH transfer? What account? And again, standard CF, that is district use for whatever they want to keep track of. Okay, so I'll go ahead and save this as, okay, so that's me, yep. So now I have 6%, but it only says $100. Now, if I tried to run a payroll, it's gonna throw an error at me because I need to add one more direct deposit because I need to have $100 of my, of my payroll is gonna go in there, but the rest of it has to go somewhere. So, so code, test, um, I don't have my account number. Four, six, five, nine, zero, three, four, nine, three. And then right here, percent. I'm gonna leave that now, it's gonna be 100%. Gonna be probably just demand. I'm just gonna check which one. I'm not certain, but again, you guys would know which account the districts would know. And I'm gonna hit save. Oh, and it already exists. You know, let me. So let's change this. I think I don't like the 703. Let's do that one. Yep. There we go. Now it is. It isn't like, so you can't use the same code, which I tried. So now he has 100%, $100 of it is gonna go into saying it was a savings account and then you're gonna need 100% on the second one. So the remainder goes into this account. So that's what that's for. Um, another option that I like is if you wanna see both screens, if you go up there and, and then it turns into those four, you can grab it and move it over, edit the other one and you can compare. And then, so then you can compare them or if you need to copy something, you have that option. I thought that was a nice feature that you can do that. And you just exit out, you save. And now my Larson has two accounts to be. Yeah. Got the blue line. And again, they can create as many direct deposits as they want or a check. If, if the employees doesn't do direct deposit, you can do check. Okay. Um, again, if they do create, then once that employee comes in, which again, I don't have an employee, I don't believe that, yeah. But once, if there is a new employee, you just create, find that employee in the drop down, and then it brings employee over and this would be blank. And then you would just add paid distributions and save. So, so every employee has to have one of these. Okay, any questions from there? Okay, and then we'll move on. Pay groups. Okay, pay groups. This pay groups for classic people, this would be in USP DAT under the USB cons or yeah, not USB con, USB pay groups, USB data and pay groups. 
Um, so this is where your pay groups. So like I said, districts coming from classic, this would all be pulled over. But if they have to create a new pay group for an employee or they have a new group, pay group at school that they created, um, this is where they can go ahead and create that. Um, so they would, um, maybe the job calendar already was created for that. So you would have to have a job calendar created first, then come into the pay group. So you can select if it's a new, completely new pay group with new work days, a new job calendar. Then you can go ahead and select what job calendar that is. You can put, enter in what pay group. You can do SEC for secretaries. And again, there's that option to create new. So if you have like 20 pay job calendars that you have to create, you wanna create new and then save. And then you can just keep creating, save. Great, save, great. And then once you're done, you can just click cancel. But if you only have one, you unclick that, and then you just create one and save, and it takes you completely out. But it's just a time saver feature. So now I have my secretaries for my pay group. So again, they don't have to have numbers. They can have letters. Okay. So, any questions on pay groups? Okay, on to the next, our payee. Okay, the payee screen is used to add, um, you can add the name and addresses of uh, payroll items um, along with the number. Um, this is which is related to the payroll item. Um, we didn't really have this in the um, dead screen or in the dead name because your dead name took care of all that. So now we have a payee screen um, to add these, and these need to be created for the payroll item configuration screen. So the payees, if I click on those, is like um, the address, the number. So you can use these numbers this, um, when you create a payroll item, then it will have where does, where does this payee get paid? So these are the addresses, the name, um, street numbers, um, where all that information for which was in dead name before is now here. So you have to create that first, a PE, if you're gonna have a new payroll item, I should say, a payroll item configuration. And again, if you have multiple to create, you can click the create new and you can just keep adding, or if you don't, just click close after you create one. Okay, and again, this option for payee is used when you have multiple, um, let's say, um, child support. Um, maybe the, all counties go to one address in Columbus. You can select for the same number as long as it's the same, that um, the payee, and then when you run um, payroll on payables processing, um, process outstanding payables, and you can select those, um, all those different child support checks, even though that might be different name, you know, for different counties, but it still goes to the same address. You can you can use one payee, and then it's like combined vendors. What it used to be in classic, and then they will all combine on one check and sent one check down to Columbus with all the different um, employees on there from different counties. I guess that's an example I can use. So that's where this would come into play. So they would have to make sure that they have a number so that way when they're selecting um, and creating new maybe garnishment or uh, child support garnishments that they have that same payee address. So that way combined vendors that used to be called can grab it and create one check when we're doing outstanding payables here from processing. Okay. Let's go on to the next. Payroll accounts. All right. Maybe. Okay, payroll accounts. This used to be your pay screen when you were classic people. 
on, so this would be the employee's payroll accounts. And again, when creating an employee, you don't have to go through each of these core options. The next step after, we're getting down there, I want to show you the employee dashboard, which is the um, next best thing to browse screen, but we had in classic. So you can create an employee under core and then go over to the dashboard over here, enter the employee's name in, and then from there it has every step of what you need to enter. So you don't miss anything. Kind of just like how when you're entering a new employee in browse screen. So, but we'll go over that here shortly. Just wanted to throw that in there. So you just, so you don't have to like start, go through each option and click and add and, there is an easier way to add, and that is in the, in the adding in the employee um, option here in documentation. It does tell you that. So, okay. So, to create an employee or a payroll account for an employee, saying it's a new employee coming in. So again, it needs every um, compensation has to have a payroll account attached to it. Um, so say. Or if you want to add, oh, it's really slow today. I just get ahead of the computer sometimes. Oh, well. oh please don't go down. Okay, I won't click anything right now because maybe it's mad at me. Hmm, it's not a good sign. I can just click out of it. All right, I think we're going down. There, okay, just didn't like, didn't like me for some reason. Okay, so I'm afraid to do create again because it, it might just, uh, nope, didn't, it's, edit too. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to bring over my PowerPoint here. Why the, my system is trying to catch up or do something. But this is what the, um, excuse me. I jumped here. Um, the payroll account, that would be where you needed to add um, your account expenditure accounts for payroll. Um, they're creating new SAS and they can, and they're available through your drop down. Um, again, you can click on create and enter in the first few letters of the employee, the first name or last name to bring up, or if it's um, and then you can choose the position by adding the account from the drop down box. And I don't I don't have a screenshot like I wanted to show you what the payroll accounts looks like. So but you would choose the account. Oh, I know what I can do. Right here. Let's just go here. Sorry about that. I uh, my I don't know if I'm going too fast in my Android doc that it's not liking me right now. So, but this is your, so when you do create payroll accounts, it will let you know if it, an uh, employee already has an account um, or it, it will directly go to, and this what would show. So if an employee already has a payroll account, you can add to it. So then this will show, and you could see that this employee already has expenditure, has, um, what's the status, you can change it to inactive, what percent is it fixed or percent? Um, employee distribution, leave projection. So does it want it to show on the leave projection report? 
And that used to be board this for classic people. Leave projection, leave pro in classic terms. Select the expenditure account. So you would click. So when you click on there, it will pull up every account that's out there on the system. So you can type in a few of the letters to start searching to help out with that. And I think we do have a jury issue out there that were wanted so you can search like USAS does, I do believe. Um, I don't think we have that search capability like they do. So I think we do have a, a ticket out there to upgrade this to, so it's easier to search. Let's see if I'm back up yet. No, I'm not. Okay. Okay. And then, so then you would have to select the status. Is it active, inactive, specific, or maximum amount? And then your rate, your percent. Um, so then you would have maybe um, a percent of it, maybe it's for grants. And then the remainder after that, um, you can put a max amount in. So maybe you have $1,000 for a grant account. So max amount of a thousand all goes in there, but once it hits a thousand, then it's going to stop. And this does not decrease, just to let you know, not like it did in classic. If you're used to that. Ah, nope, I'm not back. Okay, let me refresh. I want to give you a, um, a little break here. Give me about two minutes. We're going to see if we can get me back running up here. So let's just take like a three minute break. We'll be back here about 1116. I want to see if I can get my screen to come back up. Okay. Sorry about the, sorry about this. So we'll be, I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. I'll share though. Um, go back over to the more option. Pause recording. Okay. All right. I'm back. Sorry for the delay. We just had a little technical difficulty. Um, I just switched uh, URLs and so I'm in a different demo. So it might look a little, well, actually, it's the same. It's just a different, it's just not my demo account for my doc. So, okay. So we're back. We're rolling. Okay. So, what we were looking at um, payroll counts. So, let's just go ahead and look at this employee, Nick Schroeder. And here's the payroll counts. So now we have this expenditure. And again, like I said, the drop down. If you want to add, uh, maybe need to add an account. So again, you can add. Um, and again, like I said, we don't have that search capability like we did. So um, let me see. Oh, two. Yeah. I don't believe we have that like we did. Um, so you can just go down, you have to scroll down. And again, the first hundred are listed. So if you know the account, you might have to type it in. But again, we have that and that's available and that is coming hopefully soon where we can like type in 1100 and it should pull in like all the 1100 accounts. So, um, and then you would have the option is active inactive specific miscellaneum or maximum. So if you're going to have a maximum account, like I said, a grant account, you want to make sure you have your max amount in effect. And you're going to say, I want 100% of her pay to go in there for now until we hit that, maybe it's a $5,000 grant. And then you, of course, and again, you can start it later. If this grant's not going to start till later, you can do that. You can start it like in two months. But if you want to just get it um, created, that way don't forget, you can also do that. Um, employee distribution, like I said, that was board this from classic, leave pro, leave projection from classic. And then once you do that, see if it lets me save it. Oh, they won't throw an error out me at, at me. Yeah. So if you're adding, and the system's not going to let you let the district add a payroll count that's not 100%. So they can make sure right here that is correct before they get all the way into uh, initializing the payroll or something. So, so I'm just going to do fixed percent. Oh, I've got to put $100 in there. 
but I let me save it. But right now, 100% of my money is going to go into the 5,000%. So if I would have charge amount of $100, oh, I did, sorry. I thought I looked at the maximum side. So now, um, so it knows that the pay is going to go in there. And like I said, the maximum amount never goes down on the screen. So you're not going to be able to see that. It just stops when it's done. So just a reminder to that. Um, again, if you want to delete an account, you can delete an account that was created. Okay. Again, they can have as many accounts created as they prefer. Exit out. Why wouldn't it let me out? I don't think I'm supposed to do a demo training today. I really don't. It's like, why is it stuck? All right. Let's just refresh. Yeah. So payroll counts. So number one thing you have to remember uh, has to be an account for every compensation. Again, you can have as many accounts um, created under the payroll account for one compensation if you prefer. So like here, Nick Schroeder um, has an aid one and a secretary for position two. So they have, he has two payroll accounts created for each one. So again, you have to have um, those accounts created. All right. Okay, any questions on the payroll accounts? All right, so we'll move on. Now we're on to payroll items. So maybe what we'll do is skip down to payroll item configuration first because you have to have a payroll item configuration. And this was actually what was in uh, USB DAT and dead name. So payroll item configuration is now, um, a dead name is now payroll item configuration. So once I get a blue line here, there we go. So let's just go to payroll item first, payroll item configuration. And again, all this information will come over. Um, if they have to create a new payroll item, um, maybe a new employee comes in and he has a different annuity that nobody else has in the district, this is where you would create that first because you have to have it created first in the configuration before you can add it to the employee for the payroll item. So here is a list of all your deductions that we have out there right now. So it lists what kind it is. You have what if, if it's Fed or Ohio City, you have um, your motors, you have federal and Ohio City, um, as archives, electronic payment, employer health coverage, voluntary required. Um, again, you can add all kinds of different um, from your more. Um, to create one, you would like, um, we already have all one, so I can't create that, but maybe um, we have a new city coming in. So you would find your city. And again, you have all your options here. So you wanna make sure when you're creating annuities, make sure you have the right annuity. Um, maybe it's adoption assistance, um, child support. You have your employer, SIRS and SIRS, um, Medicare tax. Um, Social Security, SIRS, uh, SIRS buyback annuity. So again, these kind of mimic what it was in Classic when you're creating a new dead name record. So I was just saying, I'm going to do city tax. And I know I have 0016, so let's try that. All right, so now I have my city tax. And again, we have that option here on payroll item. If we were gonna create multiple records, maybe multiple city records need to be created for some reason, you can just create new and then it, you can just keep adding and then save and cancel out and close out when you're done. So it doesn't close out on you every single time, okay? 
and you enter your code in on the right this test city you can do abbreviation now again if it's a CCA you want to make sure these abbreviations are according to the CCA and RITA documentation. So you always want to make sure that you check out the CCA and RITA because we just had some issues with CCA where some of the districts weren't filling out all their information that they should be and they were rejecting the files. And we found out that they weren't doing um, their dead, which was payroll item for, on city screen, um, if they were employer or residence, employee or residence, and they're really getting picky. So you really want to make sure that you go through with your districts and make sure those screens are filled in for every employee that's a CCA or a RITA. And I guess they're even if they're not CCA or RITA, they still have a list of cities that state what they want reported and what needs to be shown in there. And down here, down here at the uh, RITA, and the CCA is up here, Rita's way at the bottom. I guess they kept them separate so you didn't mix them up. But you want to make sure the CCA codes, description, and report to CCA are all according to what they say in the, in the documentation. And when we do our calendar, is a calendar year in next year, um, we're going to make sure we have that updated in our PowerPoint to show um, exactly what they are wanting. So, you, so districts don't have this issue again next year. So they're not missing out on these fields and these fields have to be, because they have a schedule A, a schedule B that they have to look at now and they're, and they just want different things reported. And I guess, um, I guess it's kind of been like that, but they're getting really picky now before they were letting it slide and now they're not anymore. So, so we would definitely have that updated in our calendar uh, year end. So, but just a reminder, make sure those RITA and CCA are according to what they want. Um, city tax annuity options, um, again, um, usually um, non-wages city, but again, the district will have to check with that. Employer paid amounts to be taxed. Um, maybe a city taxes um, the Medicare pickup or they would have to check what what do they tax of board paid and that would have to be moved over here by the arrow um, and then you tax employer amounts and then you would do um, employer health coverage and suppress ssn for options you have that option again it's on the documentation um, if you have questions on what each field means Here is the payee. This is where, what address, when they select outstanding payables to pay, um, this is what this is. This is their address. And that was what the payee that we created. So they would have to um, pick what address is this going to be going to. And so a payee has to be included. So make sure that is in there. Okay, why is there a report to CCA but not a report to RTA? Check the box, how does report to CCA work? Okay. Uh, that is a good question. I wonder is because um, I don't know if, like I said, CCA is getting so picky on certain things. I don't know if they're, if the RITA, once you enter the RITA code for RITA and RITA description, if that is enough for our W2 proc or W2 processing to pick that up when we're doing that. I can ask why they have a report to CCA and not to uh, report to Rita, because that is a good question. Let me write that down. And not to Rita. Okay, I got it. So I'm going to ask that. So I will find that out. Okay. And then how does report to CCA work? Um, are you asking about that flag report to CCA? Is that what you're asking the check mark? Because I will find out exactly why we have the report to CCA and not um, to RITA and exactly what that report to CCA does. Because you would think you would have one for RITA too. <laughs> so I will double check on that. And send a message out on that one. Okay, so I think we got that covered on the messages. Okay, um, so that like for a city, that's what would, um, would be important to make sure that is included. So your pay cycle, 
um, payroll item configuration? Is it every payroll, monthly, quarterly? Um, so when you're doing your outstanding payables under processing, um, you can have them selected in one of these um, payment cycles. So it would have to go every payroll. Is it only quarterly gets paid? Or does it get paid every payroll or monthly? All right. So that is the W or for like city for creating. Um, if you need to adjust um, something, you can do the a pencil and adjust. You can pick a different payee if the address has changed. You can um, change the abbreviation for the W two. Um, on the some of the payroll item configurations, you have object codes. And these would be for um, for your board, um, employer, employee, like board desk, employer, I just went blank, employer um, projection reports and the reports. Um, that would be your employer distributions, employer retirement share, excuse me. Employer distributions would be your board desk, employer retirement share would be your board rent for retirement. So you want to make sure the certified, classified, and other objects are entered um, in these different ones. So if it's a certified payroll item configuration, then we'd need certified. If it's classified, then we need to have a classified. I will find out about that report to CCA. Um, for that checkbox for CCA. Um, I am I'm also not certain why they have one for CCA and not for RITA. So I will, I will double ask the programmers that and then I will send a message out. So that's a good question. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, um, let's see. Anything else? Um, again, remember the payroll item configuration, what it was in dead name, is to make sure that um, the options employer health coverage, so maybe this um, annuity um, is uh, health insurance, uh, maybe it's dental or eye, um, so you want to make sure that dental employer health coverage is checked because this has to be reported on the W-2 for that employee. Okay. Um, all right, it's 11.31, so I guess we're gonna kind of move on here. Any qu more questions on the annuity? Um, and I would double check the Reduc information for Catherine, because that is a very good question why that is that way. Um, again, um, so just creating your payroll item before, if it's a new payroll item configuration, you have to create that first. So now, once I create it, then you can go in the payroll item So this would be all your, this is how you would create your dead screen classic to your redesigned payroll item. So this would be for every employee has to have a um, selected payroll item. So most of the time you're gonna have to have a, you're a federal, you have your Ohio, maybe it's the other state. Um, if that's the case, you create it, um, you have to pick your employee. And then from here, you can pick what am I creating? So we have to create something new for Dustin Larson. We can go ahead and create um, a different annuity, add annuity. We can add an OSDI um, to that. And again, it's only going to show the first um, hundred. So so if I type in OSDI, it pulls in everything. So here you can just type in what you need. So if I just want regular ones, I can type in RAG and it brings in my regular accounts. If I just want my city to show, I can just bring in my city. So this actually has an option where you can type in and it does bring in just those that you typed in. So it does help a little bit. So maybe this employee, I need to add another city. This is another part where we did create a jury issue for this, where employee our districts were getting confused, thinking they had to create select a position. And 
we were going to do either a little message underneath or when they um, try to hide or um, select it, that's just to say, hey, let you know that now you're attaching the city tax just to position one and not to any of the other positions because that's what this means, deductions. So deductions by job. And um, so a lot of times if they want it to tax all, they need to leave this blank. And I know that there was some confusion in that and I think we're going, and there is a, a, a jury issue that we had talked about that in our sprint meetings that we need something to let the districts know that they don't have to select a position. They can leave that blank if it's for every every position that this employee works. So then like this employee, you would just have to enter your rate. It's a fix a percent um, and then what the rate is. And again, they can create um, templates. So like here I have a default template already created for my O3. And it's already it has my rate. Um, is it deduction type? Is it for employment or residence? So I might have an O3 for my um, employment that people are only employed in our county or maybe they're residents of our county. So I might have a default for each one. Um, so this is where we were, ta I was talking about that CCA is getting very picky on that they need to make sure on their city records, they have this deduction type filled in for their, their districts. And either they are employed there or they're residents of the county, the city. So make sure that your districts are looking at this. That way they're kind of ahead of the game before next year or this upcoming year. Um, all right, 11.35, we're doing good. Um, air adjustment. So if you have um, refund of a deduction and you want to do that during the, um, during the payroll, this is where you would add that error adjustments. You would just do a positive negative $50 and then you do whatever uh, description and then you would save that and then that when the, that employee gets paid that money he will be um, paid that $50 um, refund of deduction. So that's how you would do a refund of deduction for a person in the payroll. That's what this is, uh, error adjustment is used for. Or maybe um, you have to give, um, take money away from him. That's another way you can do a positive. Every time a payroll is ran, these figures down here under the totals get updated. So those you cannot change unless you do an adjustment. That's what the adjustment field is uh, for, to update these fields. Okay, so the payroll items, um, so every time a, a new employee comes in, they will have to create um, their deductions for them or payroll items for them and choose their cycles. So again, um, the, the districts probably have a checklist of what all gets included when they're creating their payroll items, um, what needs to be entered. Okay, let's see the next thing. position. Okay. Your position, this summarizes your non-contract information. So this would be, um, I'll do a edit here. So this shows your, which I, like I said before, a position has to be created before you can create a compensation. So you create your compensate or your position number. Um, what kind of position description is it? And then from here, you can do active or inactive. A lot of districts use inactive for their subs. Um, pay group, this is where the pay group is located. On compensations, it's um, in that blue and you cannot change it. So this is where you would need to change it. Um, so you would select your pay group. And then from here, you can do certified or classified. This would determine your SERS code also. This is where they keep that. Are they paid out of retirement for SERS or SERS? Also, you would have your FTE here, your hire date, um, start date. You can have a raise date put in here. Also your supervisor. 
is in here, and I think that is used for uh, EMIS reporting, I do believe. And then this is also, like I said, where your eligibility flags are. This is employee eligible for personal leave, sick leave, or vacation. So they got to make sure these are um, selected in order for them to show them that leaves so you can uh, update their leaves then. And then again, uh, reportable to EMIS. Um, and then you also want to make sure you fill out all this information, which is for your EMIS reporting. So this all has to be. Um, entered in. Your funding source. What is this employee being funded? What assignment area? What funding code? And then what percent? All right. So once you have that all entered, you can hit save. And from here, you can actually add a compensation. So once you create it, you can create your compensation right from here. You just have to make sure you save the position first and then go down here and add compensation. And then from here, you can just go ahead and create it. So you have two options. You can create the position and then go over to core compensation and add it that way, or you can create the position, save it, and then come down to the bottom left, add the compensation from here. So it just um, takes out an extra step in there. Okay. Oh. Okay. So then um, the payroll accounts, um, you cannot, it will list what payroll accounts is attached to this position. You just cannot add them or add, uh, modify them from here. You actually have to go into the payroll accounts and do that there. So. That, that is not, it used to be an option, but it is no longer. So, so position just determines what the employee's role is here. Okay, so once you in, um, in get the position um, created, it automatically updates and creates, creates and updates a person, position personnel. And if you want an employee to have this role just to see this personnel, again, if this is EMIS people, um, you can go under the system role and, under, and select the personnel underscore user role. And then this employee will see this personnel only. And then they're able to view and edit this position. So if they have to make any updates for EMIS, they can do that. And again, this will update then the other position screen once they update this, and then it will update this position screen too. So it kind of flows into the next one. All right, the last posting period. All right, so posting period. This is how the system knows um, when you close a month, like before in Classic, we would close, like SERS would close a month and they would start the new month in, in March and you start running payroll. So here, this is where we have to create, districts will have to create their, their uh, payroll for the year, their months. So they can go ahead and create the whole month and they would do that by um, starting January and then create what year um, and create and then create their February 2020, create. March, and they can create the whole um, 12 months for 2020, and then they're good for the whole year. Um, and then right now, the green shows will show what month is current. Right now, I am current in February, and you can see to the far right here on the top, it says fiscal year, uh, fe February, it's the year 2020 and February 2020. So I know I'm still in processing 2020, and it's open and current. So any data like months that were imported from Classic, you cannot reopen them. Like, so you can see all this data here. You cannot reopen these because we just re-imported our data um, and we only have February created. So right now, so I can't change any of these months. 
Um, some, some things when you're working in different screens, the transaction dates, um, that will, will require, require you to make sure that your posting periods are open for that month. If you're trying to post from a prior month or something and it's not open, it's, it will tell you, you you can't. So what the difference between open and current? Open means that you can still process a payroll and you can run reports for that posting period. So, um, but a current means it has to be current in order for you to run payroll. So open, you can still, um, current um, period affects the calculations such as um, month to date, fiscal year to date figures. So before a new payroll month can be ran, um, must mark posting period as current for posting period. So in order to run a, uh, the next, in March, my month would have to be true for current. I mean, I can keep it open my February to still run stuff. If I need to still finish up my um, February month, I can still keep it open, but I have to make sure that, and when I'm running March, it's not gonna let me because I don't have current open March, it's true. So current posting is the period in which, um, the period in which you are currently running your payroll. So just a reminder of that. Okay. All right, so we're done through core. Is there any questions on core before I go to the employee dashboard? And I'm just kind of, we're gonna kind of go over the employee dashboard. I just have a couple things on the employee dashboard to show you that can be handy. Okay, if anything pops up on the chat, I'll, I'll keep glaring, glancing at it there. <clears throat> okay, employee dashboard. This is our employee dashboard over here. And as classic people remember, um, we had, when you were on their first screen, you were able to see the bio screen, you were able to see page screen, you were able to see dead, dead screen, um, you were able to see um, all their federal, all their deductions. So we came up with this, the dashboard. So you can type in an employee's name, and now we have an employee with all the, it, it, it's about the same thing. It doesn't show, but you would have to like click on positions, and then you ring up all the positions. And you actually can do everything from here. You can create a position from here. You can delete, you can edit. Compensations. Brings up all their compensations, their leaves pay distributions, so you, payments. So this would be like their browse screen when you're checking to see what were they paid? How were they paid the last payroll? I wanna see what the breakdown is. You click on that payment number or anywhere in that line and it's gonna bring up a highlighter to the right and here is the breakdown, just like it did in Classic when it showed their browse screen, what their, if they were paid out of regular and accrued. Um, how much went into direct deposit? What was their net? What was their uh, sick balance? It shows all that information there for them now. What expenditure account were they paid out? How much did it go in? And then it, at the bottom, it says payroll items paid. So it shows how much each federal tax. It shows their applicable gross, which is their taxable. The amount that came out of their check. Was there any employer amount that came out did they have any additional amount federal? This employee did. He had $10 extra come out of his check for additional withheld. It just shows the breakdown. And if you do the line down here, it'll take you across and you can see it, it tells you everything. So if you need, if they need to find anything, if there was an error adjustment, they can see that here under that check. Is an employer error adjustment? It will show that also. Total tax of employer pickup. It breaks it down. So I don't know if districts are aware of this feature, but this can come in very handy if they're trying to look at an employee's check and they really wanna see the nit and gritty of it. This would be handy. And then also, when they're in advance, it will even show as total asterisk advance amounts. And it'll show total non asterisk advance. So maybe they have one job that was stress was advanced and then the other one was a new job and it wasn't. It should show um, partial there and partial there. See, how do you reactivate an inactive activated position you may want to reuse? Um, 
is that what you mean archive? Um, if you archive an employee position? I had a question on how do you uh, reactivate an inactivated position you may want to reuse? So you would just have to go in, um, if I understand, um, you would just have to go into that position where, jo where job status is inactive. Yes. Okay, when the, where the job act is, is in, so you would go in and you would have to go into positions and if that's what you're asking. And then you create an inactive. So it would be under position for that job position. And then you could take it from inactive to active. Okay, great. All right. So, so yes. So if you need to make it inactive to active, then you would just go to the position for that employee and edit and then job status and change that. Okay. Yep. Not a problem. Good question. All right. Any other questions on, on that? Okay. Um, let's see. So yes, yeah, so like I said, the payroll payments, um, just let your districts know that that feature is there and they can look at any of the checks and find out any of that information is all broke down for that check. Um, attendance for um, that employee is under here. So any attendance for that employee will show here. Again, this is just your attendance and absence. You have your payroll items. So this would be all your, um, like your dead screen, all, the, all everything, the payroll items that we did. So here's all his deductions. And here you can update. If he has to update an amount, you can update it here. You don't have to go to the core. Once an employee is created all the way through, you can use the employee dashboard pretty much for everything for that employee. Payroll accounts, do the same thing. You can create them from here, delete them, update them, add. And the only thing that you're probably see, not seeing, if you're not used to the employee dashboard, is the employee screen. But that is there. It's just underneath the name. And if you edit employee, it brings up that screen for them. So that's the only way you can see that screen. You have to hit edit, and then it will bring it up. I mean, you don't have to make changes. You can just exit out once you look, look at it um, if you have to. And one thing I was going to say is when you're creating a whole new employee, the only thing you have to do out of, out of the employee dashboard that you can't do is the employee itself. So when a new employee is coming in, you have to go to core employees first, create. You have to get this screen created first before you can hop over, then you can go over here, type in the employee's name, and then it brings up it brings up the employee dashboard and it brings up all these to the left. So you can just go down the list and say, oh, okay, I gotta add my positions. And then I can add my compensations because I know I have to do a position first, compensation. And then you can just go down the list or you can go, okay, I'm gonna do my position, compensation, payroll accounts. And then you can start adding. So really, it's, it's nice when you're adding a new employee. The only thing you have to do to remember is add the employee first and core, and then you can jump right over here, to enter the employee in the dashboard, and then those options come up. So then you know you're not gonna forget a step at all. And that's what's important, so you don't forget anything. So they probably have a checklist, but also this. And again, another thing the employee dashboard has is the employee photo. And I know some ITs or districts are, are starting to update that. They can create a file and make a mass big file of all the employees' photos and do one upload at one time. And I think we have instructions out there how to do that. Uh, I know one ITC we had that did it and um, started in importing. It was an ITC that actually did it for themselves. And it was neat because you, you could see the, um, the, the name, uh, the, per, the person's picture under for the, the name there. So um, again, it's not necessary that they have to do that. So it's up to them. So, okay. Um, trying to think what else is out there. We, we did the three hours. We did really good. Um, so is there any questions on anything else? I have questions about the archive for the employee. And I have um, for Catherine, the report to CCA and why the report to Rita isn't marked and what it's all for. So I got that. Is there any other um, questions that I can answer at this time. I 
All right. Okay. Well, if there isn't anything um, further, I'll wait a little bit here because I know sometimes when you're typing. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, tomorrow, Lori Miller will be presenting from 9 to noon, um, and she's going to be going through payroll processing, utilities menu, processing menu, and the USAF integration. So tomorrow is going to be a full day, too. Today, CORE took a lot of our time because CORE is huge. So, so hopefully she'll be able to get through all that. So, and again, if there's anything I missed and you're not quite sure, email me and I can get an answer for you. Not a problem. Okay. So anybody that's registered for tomorrow, Lori Miller will see you at nine o'clock then. Thank you and have a good day.